Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Several months since the Biden administration took over, the China-U.S. relationship has shown little sign of upturn, with new competition and even confrontation on multiple fronts. So, where is the bottom line for the free fall, and how should we summarize U.S. foreign policy, making from one administration to another? And how should the U.S. and the world view a rising China today? I'm very honored. To be joined by Professor Joseph Nye of Harvard University on those matters and more. That's our topic. I'm Zhou Yue. Uh, Mr. Nye,、uh, let us start with your book,、uh, your latest book, "Do Morals Matter?、Uh, Presidents and Foreign Policy from FDR to Trump." I know that you assess the decision making of U.S. leaders. And you listed three ethical dimensions: that's intentions, means, and consequences. And 14 cases reviewed in the book.、Uh, which president or which presidents you have marked the highest? Well, I gave the highest marks to、uh, the first President Bush, George H. W. Bush,、mm-hmm. and I gave him. I marks because he combined two leadership qualities that are extremely important. One is the、uh, emotional intelligence, not to let his personal feelings interrupt、uh, or interfere with his appraisal of a situation. That affects the intentions.、Uh, I also was impressed by what I call his. Contextual intelligence, his understanding of international politics, and the understanding that you often have to make compromises.、Uh, in that sense, Bush was able to preside over the end of the Cold War without any shots being fired.、Uh, he negotiated with Gorbachev. He was able to make sure that there were reasonable outcomes. And、uh, I, this is what I gave him、uh, good marks for. So, can I ask who scored the lowest points? Well, I'm afraid it, it's obvious that it was Donald Trump.、Um, <laughs> he was he was certainly a, a man who had a very narrow、uh, view of the world. Therefore, he had very little contextual intelligence.、Mm-hmm. He also、um, had、uh, a very poor emotional intelligence. He let his personal feelings and his own ego interfere with his judgments about、uh, what was a sensible policy or not. I know you wrote the book before Biden, but、uh, if you write the book today,、uh, how do you see President Biden's performance so far? Well, it's much too soon to tell,、yeah. uh, but I think he's off to a, a reasonable start. Notice that of the two qualities I mentioned. Emotional intelligence and contextual intelligence. Biden scores very well on both of those. He was a man who was、um, able to manage his own、mm. personal ego.、Uh, he is also、uh, a man who has uh, uh, more than three decades of experience in、uh, the president, in the、uh, Senate, and the vice presidency. So he knows international affairs very well. So I think he's well equipped、uh, to be a, te- a president more like President Bush than like uh, uh, President Trump.、Mm. Uh, let's talk about the three criteria as pointed out、uh, in the book.、Uh, perhaps for many Chinese,、uh, it's a little bit difficult to agree with your、uh, elaborations on good intentions and positive consequences、uh, when it comes to the current rivalry. Between the two major powers,、uh, many may even question that there is good attentions from the American part. W- what do you say to that? Well, I think、uh, obviously Americans、uh, have there are many different Americans with very different intentions. <laughs>、uh, my impression is that the、uh, in the Biden administration, people like Secretary of State Blinken and National Security Advisor Sullivan. Who represent uh, uh, Biden's views quite closely, since they worked for him、uh, for years、uh, very closely with him, and they're both men I know、uh, very well. 
Uh, I would say that they have good intentions in the sense they would like to see a stable uh, and successful relationship with China. On the other hand, they do share uh, a view which has now become a bipartisan view in the United States, mm. both the Democrats and Republicans, that China has not played fair over the last two decades, and particularly over the last decade, that uh, rising nationalism in China led China to discard Deng Xiaoping's policy of being moderate and modest uh, and biding time, and that China has stolen American intellectual property. It has used uh, unfair subsidies to state-owned enterprises to tilt the trading field in unfair ways. Uh, it is engaged in actions like building islands in the South China Sea and militarizing them. So there's a widespread view that Americans have to push back, that China mm. has been believing the United States is in decline, has rising nationalism, is pushing hard, and that it's important to push back. But that doesn't mean that you have a situation which can't be managed mm. as a, what I call a cooperative rivalry. But, but, uh, and I think both, both those men would agree that that's the intention. But, but many people here in China think that all those accusations about intellectual property rights, South China Sea, uh, China's position actually have been consistent. The only difference is that China is growing stronger uh, right now. So America's perspective has changed because of the uh, gathered strength of China. Well, I think it's true that China has been growing. Uh, remember, as far back as the 1990s, uh, uh, President Jiang Zemin asked President Clinton uh, what kind of a China would Clinton like to see? And he said, we want to see a strong and prosperous China. Uh, so the sign of Chinese strength uh, and growth was already present uh, uh, two decades ago. I think the feeling is that this changed considerably, that in the early decade, the first decade of the 21st century, uh, China was following what we see as the Deng Xiaoping policy, but that after uh, 2013, this becomes a much more assertive policy. Mm -hmm. You have policies like China 2025, which China says it's gonna dominate 10 major technologies. Uh, these are things which created fear in Washington. So yes, the China change in China's strength has changed the situation, but let's be realistic about it. It's not just the strength, it's mm. also the statements and policies that have been true uh, since about 2013. Mm. But there is also some changes perception about uh, itself here in China. Uh, recently, we have seen the U.S. Secretary of Transportation and also President Biden uh, saying that America cannot tolerate falling behind China. Uh, in the instance of Pete Buttigieg, he was talking about uh, the train travel in the U.S. in comparison with China. So, uh, is America first uh, really some kind of a fundamental law of nature in the U.S.? And the U.S. can never fathom a world where it is number two. Well, I think the the phrase America first, which President Trump used, is a mistaken way of defining the national interest. Uh, every country protects its national interest. China protects its national interest. The question is not whether you protect it or not, but how do you define it? You can define your national interest very narrowly, as President Trump did, mm. and you could define it quite broadly. For example, uh, if you look back to the period of uh, President Truman, President Truman uh, supported a Marshall Plan in which the United States uh, spent about 2% of its gross domestic product helping the recovery of Europe. That was obviously in American self-interest, but it was also in Europe's self-interest. So rather than defining the self-interest as insisting that Europe repay all its loans to the United States, he instead defined it as a way in which the Americans helped Europe to recover. That's, both of those are cases of protecting your own national interest, but one in a narrow way and the other in a broad way. 
Mm. And I think that that's the key question that we have to get Americans to understand, as well as to get Chinese to understand, mm. that if we define our national interests broadly, not narrowly, then there's a, a brand, an area for cooperation between the countries. I think that somebody like Biden understands this. Uh, the reason I ask this question is that uh, many people are asking, can Americans live with the fact that China might overtake the U.S. in some technological fields? Uh, but of course, China is still far behind the U.S. in many uh, uh, technologies. But Will it be possible if someday China overtakes the U.S. in certain technologies, Americans can accept that? Oh, I think absolutely. It's, it's already the case. I mean, when I visit China and I take the, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, fast speed rail, I wish the Americans had something as good as that. There's a case where Chinese already are technologically ahead of the U.S. So yes, there are bound to be areas um, which are uh, in which China will be ahead of the U.S., just as there are others where the U.S. will be ahead of China. The, the tension will arise when it relates to uh, technologies which are very closely uh, tied to security, and particularly military security. Mm. And that's where fear enters the equation. Uh, that's why it stimulates uh, in Washington plans to say, well, we can't allow that to happen mm. because artificial intelligence is so important to so many aspects of security that we can't accept that one. Uh, so in that sense, yes, the, 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 the competition from China uh, has stimulated uh, a very strong political reaction in the US. Uh, the Americans might not have awakened to the competition. Mm. So, uh, you know, in the sense, uh, yes, China's strength is part of, and growing strength is part of the cause, but also bragging and nationalism has helped to uh, stimulate the reaction in the United States. Uh, and also, because our economy is so intertwined, and technology-wise, there are a lot of cooperations between the people of both sides. Uh, so here in China, people still worry about where is the line uh, of national security uh, to protect technological transfer. What is your take? Well, I worry about that too. I think the, the great danger in my mind is that too many people are talking about something called a new Cold War. And this is a particularly bad metaphor to use historically. Uh, in the real Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, there is almost no interdependence economically. Uh, we had, uh, you know, virtually no trade with the Soviet Union. U.S. and China have a half a trillion dollars in trade. Similarly, there is very little social interdependence. Uh, very few Soviets came to the U.S. or mm. vice versa. Uh, today, we have uh, uh, millions of social contacts, including students and tourists. Uh, so in that sense, uh, this is not like the Cold War. Uh, there are great benefits that both China and the U.S. get from this economic interdependence. There are also, however, security risks and security problems that arise. And what we have to see is if there is some decoupling for uh, reasons of security, but it, it doesn't spill over into a widespread mm. uh, decoupling of the economies, which would be enormously expensive for everybody. I mean, China complains that the Americans don't trust Huawei. Uh, I think for good reasons they, that we don't trust Huawei from what we've seen of the history of Huawei. But it's also noticeable that China doesn't allow Google to operate freely inside China for security reasons. What about TikTok? So I think, and I, TikTok, I frank, frankly think we should allow. I don't see a danger from TikTok, which is quite different from, uh, from Huawei or ZTE. But in, in any case, to my mind, we have to be careful not to let metaphors about Cold War uh, make us realize mm. this is not like the Cold War. And we have to draw very careful lines where we decouple interdependence for security reasons and not let it spill over broadly into the relations 
of our economic and you think social. It, it takes two sides to sit down and delineate uh, the red lines together. I think, I think that's correct. I think what we should do is say, for security reasons, and here are the reasons, uh, we can't accept these following types of companies to have free access to our market. Just as you, for security reasons, say we can't accept the following companies mm. to have access on our market. And with other cases, here are the limits that we see uh, and that you see, and let's discuss this. Uh, you mentioned the Cold War, uh, because recently Biden and his team are now taking the approach of uh, gathering allies against China uh, on value basis, so-called. Uh, do you think that strategy uh, smells like Cold War mentality? Well, it can if it, if, it, if it is taken too far, but there also can be reasonable aspects of it. For example, uh, if you ask on attitudes toward uh, uh, the internet uh, or cyber or uh, surveillance technology, the values in Europe and in Australia and in the United States are much more similar mm -hmm. to the values in China. Uh, and in that sense, if we say, uh, let's have relationships of trade in products in uh, relating, let's say, to surveillance cameras or to uh, control of the internet, uh, so forth, that we will adhere to common standards among these uh, Western democratic countries and not try to accommodate the same standards as China. China will set its own standards in those areas uh, the, the Western countries, their standards, and we'll agree to disagree. In other words, that will be an area where, where uh, there will be differences. That doesn't have to be a Cold War. At the same time, that can be happening. We could be cooperating very much, let's say, on solar technology or on biotechnology that's related to pandemics mm -hmm. and so forth. So it's, it's, uh, it, there have to be distinctions between different areas. And the Cold War metaphor divides the world into two halves that are totally separate. Mm. That's not the world we live in today. Uh, let's talk about values. Uh, it also has a lot to do with what you said about morals. Uh, not only the U.S., many other Western countries have shared similar concerns. But uh, from the Chinese perspective, it seems that the Westerners share some kind of a sense of superiority about their institutions and social values. And they simply couldn't recognize that China's system has a moral equivalency in this. So do you think the Western uh, countries can accept that there is a system that is different but is also acceptable and morally justified? Well, yes, there definitely are, are. I mean, it's just just a fact of life that uh, there are different political cultures and different political systems, and uh, that's the way the world is. Mm. Uh, it still doesn't mean that one has to say, well, the systems are all uh, equal in terms of our own values. Uh, we can say your system is different, but we prefer ours, and you can say your system is different, and you prefer yours. Mm. Uh, and that's where the, the issues uh, arise. In other words, it's quite possible in my mind that the U.S. and China can cooperate in many areas of economics and ecological interdependence uh, while still differing on, uh, let's say, human rights. Mm. Uh, I know it's a contentious issue, but yeah. Americans feel that uh, uh, the way in which Uyghurs are treated in Xinjiang is violating their human rights as individuals uh, changing their persons and cultures in ways through use of state force that we say is unacceptable. China says no. If you look at the United States, um, the way Americans treat uh, uh, racial differences mm -hmm. has led to, uh, to terrible uh, circumstances, uh, both in the past and in the present. And we can uh, admit that we're not doing well on that. We have to make changes. Uh, what we don't see is that anybody in China admits that they're not doing well and that they have to make changes. Mm. But, but they each system makes its own changes. Mm. Let each system try to make things better. Um, and 
we accept that uh, 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 you know there are different systems, but we can still be critical of each other at the same time. But, but, but the problem is the Chinese think that we are never harboring any wishes to convert the American into our system, but the Americans has been trying to convert China into their system, either by criticizing the practices or the systematic errors or lecturing on what they have been doing. Uh, what do you say to that? Well, I think that's true. I think the, the uh, uh, American culture and uh, Western culture more generally tends to be more to prone to proselytizing, to trying to, <laughs> to promote the values. And China is historically uh, uh, not uh, in as much of a proselytizing culture, though it does have a tradition of being uh, a middle kingdom in which others are supposed to pay mm. obe obeisance to, uh, to China. Uh, but it's true that the two cultures are different in that way. I would argue that probably the best uh, realization of this is that Americans are always going to be preachy, uh, but Chinese can sometimes be somewhat preachy too. Talk about the Anchorage meeting. Uh, that, that meeting seems to signify one thing. Well, the Chinese has been sending a clear message. I'm your equal partner. Don't even try to talking down to us or asking an inch of areas of core interest. So, so do Americans get that message? As you said, probably the Chinese are becoming more assertive. assertive. Is it possible for America to accept that? Well, I think so. I think the, that uh, there is a clear understanding that as Chinese power rises, that Americans have to take that into account. Indeed, I've written at various times in the past, uh, in various columns I've written, that America is going to have to continue to provide global public goods, for example, dealing with climate change or pandemics and so forth, but it can't do it alone. It has to do it with China and with other countries. Mm. And after China is the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases today doesn't mean that China is, is worse than the US or Europe because we have admitted more in the past, but it does mean that no country can solve this problem alone. It's going to require what I call in my book, power with others, not just power over others. Uh, later this year, uh, the nation is gonna celebrate 100th uh, anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, so while reviewing its past 100 years of history, what do you think uh, the Chinese Communist Party has brought to China and the rest of the world? Well, if you look at uh, China's uh, uh, performance over the last uh, 40 years, uh, it's really quite remarkable. China has, has uh, raised hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, certainly since Deng Xiaoping, the the policies which have been followed providing a political stability which has been accompanied by rapid economic growth, that's good for China, that's good for the world. Mm. And many Chinese here wonder, uh, what kind of China does the U.S. want to see and does the U.S. want to work with? Uh, what kind of compromises uh, does the U.S. expect from China, ideally and practically? What do you well, think? I think, yeah, I think uh, the way President Clinton put it uh, when he answered Jiang Zemin's uh, question about that uh, remains true today. Um, a prosperous and strong China uh, is it, better for us than a weak and fragmented China. And in that sense, uh, that remains the same. In addition, I think the phrase used by Deputy Secretary of State Bob Zelik in the Bush administration, seeing China become a responsible stakeholder uh, to help to uh, produce po global public goods, I think that remains a, a, a major objective. But I think in addition to that, we're going to have to see a, a period of compromise and understanding of each other's aspirations. We're not always going to agree. We're going to be rivals, we're going to have be competitors, but we have to be cooperative rivals. And the greatest failure 
would be what I call the 1914 syndrome, mm -hmm. the sleepwalker syndrome, in which by taking risks and miscalculating, we destroy the whole system, which means that we're both far worse off. So I think those are the objectives we have. And some Chinese worry about uh, whether this could be uh, undermined by the American politics, uh, because uh, looking over the past four years, it seems that American policy is not that consistent anymore. Could any kind of international cooperation be compromised because of the polarized American politics? For example, the climate change cooperation, uh, the trade agreements, the technological agreement. Uh, is this something that you worry about? Yes, very definitely. Uh, domestic politics affects foreign policy. That's true of all countries. Um, in the United States, uh, if we had a turn back to uh, nativist populism, such as we saw in the four years of Trump, that could disrupt this international cooperation. But frankly, domestic politics in China, the rising nationalism, mm -hmm. uh, is a really dangerous situation. So that's why it's be so important for both sides to manage the relationship carefully. But, but, but you'd look at the performances of the CPC, the political system in China, and uh, what the uh, bipartisan politics have been doing to America, especially in the time of COVID, maybe uh, people are worrying uh, which system might learn from the other. Well, both, both have their pluses and minuses. For example, the weakness of the Chinese system was that its first reaction to COVID in Wuhan was uh, denial and censorship. Uh, and it didn't stamp down on things quickly enough. Later, uh, it was able to clamp down much more effectively than in the United States with its federal system of 50 different states and, uh, and two different political parties. So uh, in, on the other hand, in the United States, um, the, uh, the creativity which led to the production of, uh, of vaccines within a year, which are very effective at the 90% level, uh, shows that there's some virtues to the pluralistic system. Mm. So I think both sides have, the COVID has showed that both sides had strengths and both sides had weaknesses in dealing with this crisis. Yes, indeed. On that sobering thought, thank you so much, Professor Nye, for your insights. Well, I've enjoyed the conversation. <laughs>